You may have a seat, and if you could open to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, you'll find that on page 957 if you care to use one of the pew Bibles. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I'm having you sit just because I'm reading a couple of sections and a little bit longer. 1 Corinthians 10 and 1 Corinthians 11. We're going to continue this morning in our just two-week series on the Lord's Supper or the communion service, explaining some of it, seeking to deepen our experience of it because we'll benefit from it. <clears throat> so last week we looked at a theology of the Lord's Supper, and this morning we'll finish with the practice of the Lord's Supper. So I'm reading from the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I'm going to begin reading at verse 16. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body. For we all partake of the one bread. We'll stop there. We turn to 1 Corinthians 11. Verse 17. But in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it's not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And I believe it in part, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not, for I receive from the Lord what I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. And that is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. But if we judged, judged ourselves, truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together, wait for one another. If anyone's hungry, let him eat at home so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. How about the other things? I will give directions when I come. <laughs> this is the word of the Lord. May God bless the reading of his word to your hearts and your minds. <clears throat> well, last week we looked at a theology of the Lord's Supper. We were looking at the biblical roots of the Lord's Supper, saying that uh, when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, it's not like there was no background or anything like that at all. And we said that the Lord's Supper, and most of you are aware of this, it is uh, one of two ordinances or sacraments that are given to the church by the Lord Jesus Christ, the first being baptism. And uh, being an ordinance or a sacrament is referred to in some traditions, it is a sign, an outward, visible sign, a marker of invisible spiritual realities. Signs point to the realities. They are not themselves the reality. Signs are intended to confirm to our hearts the truth of what God has promised in his covenant with his people. 
And we said that in the Old Testament, uh, meals, meals were often enjoyed as signs of the ratification of a covenant. Uh, meals depicts fellowship. A meal depicts intimacy, uh, intimacy with God. And all these meals, for example, we said were partial restorations, partial pictures uh, of the restoration of what was lost by our first parents in the garden through our, their rebellion, our sin. We are alienated from God. We are separated from God. And God's plan is to restore that intimacy, to be uh, in the midst of his people and dwell openly with his people. And when these meals were uh, repeated throughout their history, uh, they reinforced that message from God, his intention to restore intimacy, his, his desire to, to redeem and forgive them of their, their sins. It also uh, strengthened their identity. We are the people of promise. We belong to God. These, these promises have been given to us. The Passover meal, we said, was one such meal. Probably the most significant one, right? The Passover meal was, uh, was such a sign in the, in the Mosaic covenant, that little lamb that was killed and the blood that was put on the doorposts and so forth. They were to look back and remember that, that redemption. We said that Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper in the context of that Passover meal, that Passover meal that he longed to have with his disciples on the night that he was betrayed and arrested. Uh, we said that the Lord's Supper, therefore, for the people of God, replaced the Passover. It's not that we were moving from bad to what is good. We were moving from the old covenant to the new covenant, moving from the shadows to the realities. And so there's an expansion here and more clarity, more light being shed on how God is going to restore that intimacy. Now that's seen in this meal, the Lord's Supper instead of Passover. So then we ask, well, if those are the roots of, of the Lord's Supper, what is the meaning, the significance of the Lord's Supper? What's being conveyed? What's being said? And we said these four things by way of review. We said the Lord's Supper is a visible declaration of the church's unity, our oneness in Christ, right? In Luke 22, when Jesus... Uh, uh, instituted the Lord's Supper, he gave them one cup, and he said, take this cup and, and, and divide it among yourselves, which was a bit unusual. And then Paul says, and we just read here from 1 Corinthians 10, we partake of one bread. We are one body, right? And so the Lord's Supper unites the individual with the community. That's what we said. Now, secondly, the Lord's Supper points forward in anticipation of the great messianic banquet to come, which is a depiction of what? The consummation of God's promises, full intimacy with one another, all the people of God throughout the ages with the Lord. Um, in Luke 22, Jesus said, I will not drink of the fruit of vine again until, until the kingdom of God comes. And by that he meant in its consummation. And Paul said, we just read, every time you eat and you drink, what do you do? You declare the Lord's death until, until he comes. And so the Lord's Supper not only unites the individual with the community, but the Lord's Supper unites the present with the future. And it points that way. Thirdly, we said the Lord's Supper points backward. I think we're most familiar with that, right? The Lord's Supper points backward as a commemoration and a proclamation of the substitutionary death of Jesus, atoning substitutionary death. This is for you, my body given for you, in your place instead of you. First, in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Paul says that Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed, right? He gave himself. That is the true and final sacrifice. As you heard read, the once for all sacrifice. So the Lord's Supper connects the individual with the community. The Lord's Supper unites the present with the future. The Lord's Supper connects the present with the past, right? And then lastly, lastly, we said the Lord's Supper also confirms 
confirms to our conscience all the new covenant blessings uh, that were, were part of the new covenant, right? Jesus said, this cup, which is poured out for you, like the, the pouring out of the, uh, of the blood of the animal sacrifices, is the new covenant in my blood. And what are the blessings of the new covenant? Intimacy with God, like unknown before. A new nature, right? A new heart to be given. The law written on our hearts rather than outside. And uh, the forgiveness of sins to be remembered no more. Knowledge of God. Everyone in the new in the new covenant knows the true God, and so forth. So all of that is wrapped up in the significance of the Lord's Supper. And so the Lord's Supper connects the believer to God in the context of the new covenant blessings. Those are the four things. Now, I won't review any more. If you, if, if, if you want to understand those a bit better and you weren't here last week, you may want to listen to that because this is just helpful to deepen your experience and participation in the Lord's Supper. So now we come then to this morning to the, uh, the new section, which is the practice of the Lord's Supper. Uh, and here's where the church doesn't speak with one voice, and we have all sorts of tributaries left and right. And part of the reason is we don't have explicit directions in the New Testament regarding many of these questions. And so this is where different communities of faith uh, sort of take different uh, positions on some of these things. So I'm going to frame them in three questions. First of all, what are the benefits of partaking of the Lord's Supper? Before we talk about the mechanics of it, let's remind ourselves, uh, what's the, what good is it? What are the benefits of the Lord's Supper? In other words, this way, if the Lord's Supper is a sign of spiritual realities and not the spiritual realities themselves, well, then how does the sign benefit me? How does participating in the sign affect the believer? Does it give the believer anything? Now, I would say that all Christians and all Christian traditions believe that we celebrate the Lord's Supper for our good. <laughs> so it is for our benefit. It is for our good. It is God's gift to us. The question is, in what way, right? How so? Uh, so we are expanding a little bit on what we said last week. Last week we talked about how the Lord's Supper becomes a seal to our conscience. So let me begin by saying this, and how does the Lord's Supper benefit you? Well, first of all, the Lord's Supper is what theologians call the means of grace. A, excuse me, a means of grace. A channel of God's grace. A vehicle, if you would, of God's grace to you, the believer. How do we define a means of grace? What do we mean by that? Well, Wayne Grudem in his systematic theology helpfully defines it this way, very clear. He says, a mean, the means of grace is any activity within the fellowship of the church that God uses to give more grace to Christians. Any, any activity, and I would say any God-ordained activity, it's not that God would use things that you make up, right? Such as, well, I'll, I'll walk in a circle seven times and sing this one song and God's going to do something. Well, you may have made that up, but that's not God's means of grace, you know? And so it's any activity that God deems that he has ordained through which he will convey his grace to his people. The, words, the means of grace are such as the Word of God, right? The Word edifies you. The Word builds you up. The Word preached. The Word heard. The Word read. It's a means of grace. His Word is living and active, and God uses that to, to affect you. Prayer is a means of grace. Through, by faith in prayer, we reach up into the heavenlies, and God gives us His mercy and grace to help in time of need because we have a, a merciful high priest. Fellowship is a means of grace. Why? Because God has placed spiritual gifts in each believer. We saw in 1 Peter, we are to be good stewards of the manifold grace of God, building each other up. So those are all means of grace. And so the Lord's Supper is also a means of grace. Now, some, and that might be new for some of you, some resist this notion 
uh, typically in, in very strong fundamentalist uh, church circles or fundamentalist Baptist circles. They, they would say, <clears throat> some fundamentalist, fundamentalist traditions, that the Lord's Supper is not about what God is doing, but it's what I'm doing. I'm here to remember. I'm here to proclaim his death, right? There's no special blessing here. God doesn't give anything to me. The only thing good that comes is obedience, and obedience is always a good thing to do. But there's no special measure or unique sort of grace that God gives it. We do it because it's commanded, and obedience is its own blessing. Now, I think that's mostly a reaction, uh, probably an overreaction, right, to the historical roots of the Roman Catholic Church and the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, in the Roman Catholic Church, their understanding of the sacraments, of which communion, right, would be one of them, or the Lord's Supper, is that a sacrament can infuse grace in the participant regardless of the presence or absence of faith. Okay? It just works because of the power that's being performed itself. Then they use that Latin phrase, ex opera operato, which means from the work performed. In other words, through the mechanical working of my doing this and you participating, you're going to receive the grace of God, whether you have faith in Jesus Christ or not, you see. Uh, in other words, it's like take a cup and then you fill it with water. The cup is nothing. The cup doesn't need to believe. It's just getting filled with water. That is not a biblical understanding, right? Grace is not infused in people by participating in sacraments whether they have faith or not. But that's the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. Signs only benefit those who believe, who have faith in what God has taught is happening in that ordinance or in that sign. And so the visual gospel, the bread and the cup, just like the verbal gospel, only benefits those who what? Believe. <laughs> who believe what God is saying in the signs and receive the benefits that God has promised uh, through that sign. We walk by faith, says Paul, right? The righteous lives by faith, right? Everything that's not from faith is sin, says Paul. So, yeah. So, that became an overreaction to the Roman Catholic teaching that you see there's power in just, in, in just us giving this to you, power in itself by the working of it. And the overreaction is that there's nothing happening here at all. <laughs> God isn't doing anything, <laughs> It's about what we're doing. We're obeying God, and we're going to remember him, and obedience has its own blessing. Now, not too many would present it like that. I'm overstating it, I think, a bit to get across sort of the thinking that is behind some, some traditions now. Most Protestants, and I'm speaking broadly now, that's so why I use the word Protestant, right? Non-Roman Catholics. Most Protestants, including many contemporary Baptists, where that very stern sort of view was from, believe the question is not whether the Lord suffers a means of grace, but how. We agree that God ministers to us. It is a, min a means of grace to us, but the question among most Protestants is how does it function as a means of grace, right? The Lord's Supper to most is primarily about what God is doing here. What God is saying to us, what he is doing in this gathering, and not so much about what I'm doing, though I am doing, I am declaring, I am participating, and so forth. The means of benefiting from what God does is what? Faith, right? Faith is the means for receiving what God is doing, what God is giving in the Lord's Supper. And so the question is, how? How is he blessing us? What, 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 what is God doing in our hearts, in our souls, through the Lord's Supper? How does he benefit us? Well, look down at chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians. Here's where the discussion goes. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16, where I read, he, 
This is the Apostle Paul. He's correcting errors, and I think you picked up on that. <laughs> He's collect, uh, correcting some errors, and he says here, the cup of blessing, that's also translated the cup of thanksgiving, from the Greek term to eucharistel, the verb eucharistel, from where you hear what? Eucharist. So that's why some traditions call it the Eucharist. They didn't make it up. It comes from here. <laughs> And so he says, the cup of blessing that we bless, or the cup of thanksgiving that we bless, is it not a participation? Now, that's the key idea right there. Is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? And the bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there's one bread. We who are many are one body, for we all partake. We are participating of this one bread. And I mentioned, uh, I believe, last week that that word participation, you see, this is part of the key idea. What's happening, this word is the koinonia word, which you've many heard in different ways. The, the term means, speaks of what? A deep and profound partnership, a, 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 a fellowship. It was used to speak of marriage. It was used to speak of business partners. And so he's saying there is a profound, there's a deep connection that's going on with the body of Christ and with the blood of Christ. That's what's happening, he says. And why does he stress this? Well, he stresses this because the problem that he is correcting is the fact that the Corinthians, many of them, were also still going to these idolatrous feasts. And he says, don't you understand that when you go to those idolatrous feasts and you participate in the way that you do, you are participating, you are in fellowship with demons. They're behind these uh, false teachings, is what Paul says. And I don't want you to be a participant with demons. Verse 21, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake, be in deep, profound fellowship, communion of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Shall we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Is that what you want to do, he says? Are we stronger than he and you see, before that, he had used Israel as a, an example, their experience in the desert. He says, you know, in a way, they were baptized into Moses. And in a way, they participated in a meal in manna. And what happened to them when they were idolatrous? Did God just leave them alone? No. They were all killed in the desert. And this is where he's going in chapter 11. That's why some of you are sick. You, you, can't, you can't have your foot in both worlds. And so, this is what he's saying here, that this is how, how, how profound the time is that we share, is that it, there is a fellowship, a communion, a, a near participation with the body of Christ and the blood of Christ. And the question then comes is, well, how so? And this brings out the, the debate on the presence of Christ in the Lord's Supper. How is Christ present in his body and his blood? He said, this is my body. This cup is my blood. And from there, uh, the debate ensues, right, as to what did he mean by that. I mentioned last week that there, that, that there are various uh, traditions. I mentioned briefly uh, the Roman Catholic teaching. Let me go over that again so you understand what's happening, what they believe is happening, what they're saying is happening in the Roman Catholic Mass. And you have this on your outline again. If you don't have one, you can get one later. This, uh, the term that sums up the Roman Catholic position is transubstantiation. What does transubstantiation mean? It means to convert one substance into another. Transubstantiation, the substance change, convert one substance into another. And so their teaching is that the mystery takes place, that when the priest holds up the, uh, the, uh, the host, and he, what's happening as he speaks the words of the Mass is the bread is literally becoming the body of Christ, and, and the cup, the wine in the cup, is literally being uh, converted into the blood of Christ. And so Christ is being re-sacrificed in the Mass, you see. And that's the teaching, in essence, uh, of that. This was profoundly rejected during the Re Protestant Reformation 
by all the church that went through the Protestant Reformation. All traditions uh, reject that view completely and utterly. Why? Because, one, Christ's body is only in heaven. We must not diminish the truth that he is the God-man forever. He is a man. He stands in our place. Yes, he's the God-man, but he, you don't have his body there and here simultaneously. Remember, we said no one sitting around the table when Jesus said, this is my body, would think that that bread just became his body. There's his body right in front of them, you see. So it couldn't mean that. Secondly, it was direct, rejected on the on the grounds that the adoration of the host and the, and, and, and the wine is idolatrous. Uh, this is not Jesus that he's holding up, but they, it's treated as if he is, and that's an idolatry. And so as you reject that on those grounds, and the third grounds is that if this is the re-sacrifice of Christ, what does that do? It undermines what you heard read earlier. It undermines what the gospel is saying. What? That it is finished. That Christ offered himself once for all, the just for the unjust, in order that he might bring us to God. And so transubstantiation was rejected by all Protestant traditions on those three grounds. Now, the second position historically, and it's primarily held by Lutherans, not all, but primarily held by Lutherans, uh, is called consubstantiation, even though Luther himself didn't say, I call this consubstantiation, I label this, this is my view. Uh, it's, it's what he argued for uh, was this. He was wishing to correct the errors of the Roman Catholic Mass. Remember, he himself was a monk, right? He was wishing to correct the errors of them, and so he was saying, though the elements don't literally become the body and blood of Christ, the body of Christ is over, under, around, and near the bread. So the bread is still bread, but the body is around, under, near. Con, substantiation. Con is the prefix with. So the body is with the bread, and so forth. And then... Um, that was Luther's argument, Luther's view to some degree. Now, responding to this was Ulrich Zwingli, uh, who would be considered the, the founder of the more Baptist position, which is called the memorial position. Though I will say that Zwingli, if, if you read him, and I just don't have time to go over this all, but throughout his writings, he did not hold to what people have made his view to be which is what? Merely memorial, only memorial, you see. He did not argue that, okay? But in responding to Luther, he said that Jesus, Jesus' body is not literally here as the Roman Catholic Church teaches because the bread becomes his body, and his body is not literally here just right next to the bread, Luther, <laughs> because his body is still in heaven, is what Zwingli said. He said he, he is here uh, figuratively, not literally. Where is the Son of God? At the right hand of the Father. And so he said the bread in the Lord's Supper and the cup is a pictorial reminder. Do this in remembrance of me. It's a memorial view. And so though Christ is always present um, through his Holy Spirit, meaning he said, Lo, I'm with you always, to even to the end of the age. That's the only way he's present. What's this, what, what this, where this view ends up, he's not present in some other special way in the Lord's Supper. Uh, and, and again, uh, towards the end of his life, Zwingli would have never said that last part. He said it is a memorial, but it's not merely a memorial that, God, that Christ ministers his presence through the Holy Spirit in a special way at the Lord's Supper. There's some clear statements that he said that. But anyways, that's still called the memorial view, and we still got that poor guy's name stamped to it. And, and, it's, and it's been reduced to what? Mere memorial, okay? A mere memorial. Only memorial. And, that, and that's it. Now, now the reform view 
uh, which encompasses several different Reformed denominations and groups, right? The Reformed view is called the spiritual presence view. Christ is present, and he's present spiritually. Again, his body is where? His body's in heaven. He's at the right hand of the Father. But the Lord is present here in a way that's different than he's present everywhere through the Spirit. He's present in a special way with his people in this meal, in this fellowship meal that we have together. Now, there's two streams of that view, and I just briefly share them, okay? Two streams. The first is uh, the reformer John Calvin's view. It's kind of complicated, and so it's, it's, what I mean is complicated to understand exactly what he's getting at, but what, what he says is not that in the Lord's Supper we bring Christ down in our presence spiritually, but that in the Lord's Supper we go up and we are present with him there. And that's what he's saying. So our fellowship here is, is, is happening in heaven in some spiritual way. You can read pages and pages and pages and pages of that and still go, huh? I, I, I'm trying not to get this, Calvin. I respect you, but it's hard to grasp. So that's one stream in the Reformed church. There are people who hold that. Uh, so uh, the, the, the vast majority reform view is, is, is found, for example, in the Westminster Confession, which would be the Presbyterian version and others, Covenant version, and the other one would be the 1689 Confession of Faith of Baptists and the 1644 Baptist Confession of Faith and so forth. And, and what is that? Again, that Christ is present spiritually. He's present in a way beyond that he's just present all the time with the church through the Spirit. He's present in a special way to bless us, to build us up by means of the Holy Spirit as we receive this uh, supper together by faith. And they would argue, for example, the special presence of Christ from Matthew 18, where two or more are gathered in my name, there I am in their midst which is a closer sort of presence. They say, well, that's, that context is discipline. But what they're saying, yeah, if he could be present in a special way to discipline, don't you think he'd be present in a special way to bless you? You know, that's one of their arguments, if you, if you understand that. Uh, also, um, it's by others, it's seen as being analogous to uh, his presence in the and the verbal word, right? The gospel being preached. In other words, doesn't Jesus say that my sheep hear whose voice? My voice. So there's a special working of Christ with his people when he calls his sheep. And they're saying, well, in that same way, uh, the sheep hear his voice in the supper. He comes here to speak to our hearts in our conscience and so forth. So, so there you have it. Those are the four sort of big views, and there's, uh, you know, sort of like modifications on, on each one here and there. There's different, uh, uh, different ways that, that, that they speak of it. Uh, Charles Spurgeon, a well-known Baptist, again, there was not a mere memorialist. He's one of the best-known Baptists, and he was not a mere memorialist. He said, we, he said, uh, he said that uh, believers have the blessed privilege of going right through the veil into Christ's own arms uh, when we gather. That's his figure, beautiful, f flowery way of right saying you experience the embrace of Christ in a special way in the Lord's Supper. So, so you say, well, where are we? Where do we stand? Well, we do have a confession, uh, and, and we have a doctrinal statement. And our church historically says that we are in broad and essential agreement with all the historical confessions of the early church, right, the early Orthodox confessions, the Apostles' Creed, the Euthanasian Creed, and, and so forth. And we're in broad and essential agreement with uh, many of the Reformed confessions here and there, but confessions are written at different times to address different, different, uh, different matters, so there's, there's more details to be added. We're a Reformed church in our understanding of the gospel, how God saves by his grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, right? To his glory alone. We are baptistic, meaning that we perform believers' baptism. We believe those are the ones who ought to be baptized. But we do not belong to one Reformed Baptist 
denomination. That we are an independent local church that's reformed in its understanding of the gospel and baptistic in its understanding of, of the ordinances, but not mere memorialism. I would have to say that that's just too reductionistic. Um, we need to recover, I think, and I'm talking about us now, okay? And this is why we're doing this in part. I know we have people here from different backgrounds, different, different traditions. That Everyone agrees uh, that the Lord's Supper involves memorialism, right? It involves what? Remembrance. Absolutely. Remembrance is at the root of true Christian worship, right? What is worship? It is a response. How does it work? Remembrance and response. Remembrance and response. I am the Lord your God, right? I brought you out of Egypt, carried you on eagle's wings. We remember what he's done. Eat the Passover. Remember what I've done to redeem you. And then respond in worship. Remembrance is powerful. And it's at the very base and root of worship, right? You know that power of remembrance. You know, just running into, running by accident, running into photos of dad this Recently, you know, I just, the power of remembrance. It just hits my gut, hits my heart, either with joy and laughter about something or, or some sadness. Remembrance in itself has power, right? And so, uh, yes, the Lord's Supper is remembrance, memorialism, but it's not mere memorialism or it would not be a means of grace. I think we need to strengthen that a bit. Uh, if that is just... Uh, two reductionistas. The Lord's Supper uh, also is a communion, right? a participation, a fellowship with Christ who is present with his church to minister to our consciences and our hearts in a special way by our gathering in his name as one body to remember him, to praise him, and to thank him, right? And it's, we benefit only by having faith in Christ. The benefit comes from believing the Lord and trusting in his word. Um, and this, therefore, becomes a time when the Lord ministers the, to our hearts. It becomes that seal and remember of ownership and marks us, reminds us yeah, we belong to the Lord. I've been purchased at a price, a precious price, the price of the blood of Christ. And all is well. God loves me. My sins are forgiven. Romans 5, 1 and 2. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. And so it brings us back to our status, brings us back to who we are in Christ Jesus. And the Lord ministers that peace and that assurance in a special way. Now, it's true, that, and you would say this from your own experience. I would say, every one of you would say, I don't always feel that. Correct? You might say, I don't always sort of feel that kind of, uh, of assurance, that peace that comes with the certainty. And I, I'm talking at, at the Lord's Supper, you know, say, sometimes we say, well, the Lord's Supper was so great last time we got, and then what's that mean? It means it wasn't great the other time, right? If it was so great that time. But let me say this, that your feelings in the Lord's Supper, nowhere in the Bible does it say how you are feeling at that moment defines nor authenticates the Lord's Supper. God is here ministering to his people. So, that's what are the benefits. Who may participate in the Lord's Supper? The Lord's Supper is a church ordinance uh, given to the church. So this implies a few things. What? First of all, the obvious. The Lord's Supper is for believers only. Only for Christians, people who have been born again by the Holy Spirit, had their eyes open, and they placed their faith in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. We are communion, communing with Christ, our Lord and our Savior, right? And, uh, so as one uh, author said, you can't dance with the devil and Jesus simultaneously. You've been born again, you've let go of one hand, and you're holding on to Christ. So it's for the it's for believers. Secondly, it assumes a gathered community. The Lord's Supper is not meant, it was not given to the church per, for private, isolated events. 
it, when you gather, he says, when you come together to celebrate the Lord's Supper, you see. Each time the Lord's Supper is mentioned in the New Testament, it's either using the word gathering, they were assembled, right? Or as Paul says here, when you come together, uh, it is a church event. It's not fitting for individual events. It's not designed for that. That is shutting people out from what would be what belongs to the church, which emphasizes what? We are one body. And though the question gets asked sometimes, well, what about taking the elements to shut-ins? I mean, the people who are ill, they can't, they can't come. Well, and we faced this over the years, and this is what we've done, just so you know. You don't just send one person with the elements. Why? Because the body is not in the bread. <laughs> It's not like this is magical and I got to take the ones we use today and I got to run it over there and make sure this guy gets it. The Lord meets us in the gathering. He's not in the bread. <laughs> he meets us in the supper. And so we like to send a, 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 a representative group of people from the church, four, five, six sometimes. Sometimes we'd sing songs, gathered around the individual and, and, and break the bread and drink the cup with this person. But it's not, it's not send the bread, you know. You know, there's no DoorDash involved. Send it over there, you know. Make sure he gets it. And so uh, th this also means that if, if it's for believers, and we're talking about in a gathered setting, it also means that people who profess to be believers, proclaim to be Believers, but have been disciplined out of the church. They have been removed from the church. Why? Because they're not living like believers. They don't repent of a known public sin, and they're kind of going on in it. They, uh, some use the word excommunicated. So if, if, if that's the case, then they are not to participate. Why? Because this is for believers, and for all practical purposes, purposes this person is not living like a believer and refuses to acknowledge it. And so the table is not for uh, those who would be under the discipline of the church. Now, what about children? This is another question that comes up. If you've been listening already, you would probably say, as long as the child believes, right? It's for who? Believers. <laughs> the age is not the question. The question is whether uh, th this child is a believer. This child has been born again and is a Christian. You see, our understanding of the new covenant is different than the old covenant, where the infants of, of, of uh, the male infants uh, of believe of, of participants in the old covenant who didn't have to even be believers, they just had to be Jews, they received the sign of circumcision and so forth. But baptism is not a parallel to that. You see, in the new covenant, everyone who is in the new covenant is a believer. Right? I have written the law on your hearts, and you know God. You don't need to be told, know God, because you know him. And so though the children of believers are born into the visible church, they are not yet members of the true church, the new covenant people of God, until they are born again and believe in Christ. And so parents, sometimes maybe your heart gets tugged when your child says, I feel left out. You know, I'd like to taste that. <laughs> I'm thirsty. <laughs> you know, bring water, man. Give it to them. Uh, when you, your heart may get tugged like that, understand that Having the child refrain will, will help accentuate his need or her need to know who Jesus is and receive his grace in the gospel. Believe him. Uh, so let it point to that rather than giving in to the pressure. Now, uh, what, did, what did Jesus say recorded? What did John say about uh, Jesus in John 1? To all who did receive him, even those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. When do our children become children of God? When they have believed in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but they were born of God. Now they are the children of God. You see. 
I know there's difficulties with that, but that's a, I think that's what the text is teaching us. Now, what about baptism? That comes up too, right? Uh, we know that baptism is the rite of or the ordinance of initiation. So should, must a person be baptized before they take the Lord's Supper? Well, logically, baptism would precede it because it's the, uh, the rite of initiation, right? Logically. And, and didn't Jesus say in Matthew 28, 19, said, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them. A baptism comes before teaching them, and Lord's Supper is part of teaching them, so they should be baptized before they, before they take the Lord's Supper. And that's, that's how the argument should go. But there's also another question. What about those who are believers now? They may be adults. They are believers now. They've been believers for years, but they haven't been baptized because they were baptized uh, as, as infants, and they haven't taken uh, a, a new baptism where they feel like they don't need to. And from the Baptist position, that would be you actually weren't baptized. What about them? Should they be kept from participating in the Lord's Supper? even though they're Christians, but they haven't either received a, pro a proper baptism or have never been uh, baptized. Well, the view, the view that says, yes, in all cases, the church must keep people out of the Lord's Supper who are believers but have not yet been baptized. And that position is called close communion. Not closed with a D on the end, <laughs> You know, like, shut the door. No, no. But close communion, like we're keeping this family really close. So you baptize, then you can be part of the Lord's Supper, and so, so forth. That is, by the way, the historic uh, doctrinal position of the Southern Baptist Convention. Not all Southern Baptist churches do that, but that is the historical Position Now, I, reckon, I can respect what they're saying because logically it should precede it, right? But Scripture nowhere directly requires baptism as a prerequisite. It's, it's logically, we say, yeah, it would precede it, but Scripture nowhere requires that. And you say, well, why would the Lord maybe have left out that... Uh, that requirement or not made it clear. Well, first of all, baptism isn't always done immediately. And you may not be able to baptize immediately. And if the church, like ours, says, we, we'll, we baptize when we get three or four, and then we'll, and then we'll baptize. So why you're, you're, the problem is you and your calendar. They want to be baptized so they could take the Lord's Supper, but you say, wait till July. You see, now you're keeping me from the supper, which you say is a means of strengthening me, and nowhere in Scripture does it say I have to be baptized before you let me take the Lord's Supper, you see. And so I think that's too, that's too strict. And so this, this, position is known, uh, this position is known as open communion. The first one is close, and this one is open communion. Furthermore, there might be a problem in people's thinking, why? Because since you keep people from participating in the Lord's Supper if they've been disciplined, and here's an adult I know to be a Christian, and they can't participate, was he disciplined? <laughs> was she disciplined? What's, what's going on here, you see? And so open communion says that the Lord's Supper is open to all, all believers who are members, one way or another, right, of a, in, members in good standing, meaning they have not been disciplined, all believers who are members in good standing of a gospel-believing church or evangelical church, or, although these, you know, these terms mean different things to different people. So you may participate if you're here with us today. You are a Christian. You believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is your is your Lord and Savior, you've placed your faith in Him. And you're not a member of this church, but if you are a member in good standing of a true church, uh, to use that word, an evangelical church, you're welcome to participate with us. That's how it's presented, you see. Now, we sent out some families, some people to plant Trinity Church in Benicia, and some of you on occasion will go visit. 
and Ryan over there is, 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 um, is the pastor. He's ministering there. And they are strictly joined to the Southern Baptist Convention and its doctrine. And so if you were to go to the Lord's Supper there, you would hear him say, if you are a baptized Christian member in good standing of a church, then you may participate with us and so forth. So that's what you, you, you've been hearing. I hope you'll be hearing it more now with a little more clarity, right, when we, when we announce that as we speak on the Lord's Supper. And, uh, and this is what we're doing right now, today. Uh, now, the, the question comes up. This is important. I want to deal with this and then lastly deal with those little, little details, okay? <laughs> Let's deal with two big things. Are there times when a believer really should voluntarily abstain? In other words, we're not saying you aren't qualified. Uh, but is there a time when a believer should voluntarily abstain? And this is a fairly common practice, which is really, it's sad in some ways, you know. Some believers abstain because they feel they're just not properly prepared, that, uh, that they're struggling with some sin in their life. And, and this arises from certain traditions that they've had in their background, maybe, or a lack of understanding or teaching, or especially it, it comes from a misunderstanding of the call to examine ourselves in what I read from 1 Corinthians eleven twenty eight. 28, right? Examine yourselves, lest you participate in an unworthy manner. And so what is this examination of self? What is this unworthy manner in which uh, they were participating in Corinth? Let me just sum up what was happening. You heard me read it, so I'm not going to go back over it for the sake of time, but what happened was uh, that the early Christians, two things you need to know. The early Christians uh, took the Lord's Supper uh, in the context of a full meal. So somewhere in a full meal you have the Lord's Supper, okay? Secondly, they met in homes, they met in homes. They, there was no situation where it was like this, okay? And they met in homes. There might be various homes. And in Corinth, and uh, archaeologists demonstrated, historians demonstrate that these homes were Roman-style homes and, and that the, mostly the bigger ones where maybe some of these churches would meet were owned by richer people, wealthier people. And there was a sort of an inner room inside that home. Um, uh, which was called a triclinium, but which would seat 8 to 12 people. 8 to 12 people. And then there was other areas, a broader area, or in some cases, areas that went outside, and that, that was a large area where other people went. And the Roman hierarchical sort of cultural status uh, designation was that that inner room was for your wealthier people, your special guests, and so forth, right? Roman citizens of, of certain stature. And the other areas, that was for other people. You know, that was for either servants or slaves or other kinds of friends or invitees, but they just weren't the part of that special group. And so what was happening, it appears that what was happening in Corinth is that suppose they were coming for the Lord's Supper, they were coming to have full meals, and the rich would be in that inner area in these homes, and they'd get going eating, get drunk uh, before the poor sometimes wouldn't even arrive because they tend to work longer and, or be occupied on the Lord's Day. And Paul says, what are you doing? You're not, you're not eating the Lord's Supper. You're denying the very imagery that the Lord's Supper is conveying, <laughs> which is what? That our identity is in the gospel, in Christ. There's no rich or poor, right? There's no higher or lower. Uh, you guys are, you guys gather more with your identity lined up with the Roman culture than the church. I can't believe it, he says. Don't you have homes to eat in? So if you're hungry when you're going to the Lord's Supper, you know, pre-feed. <laughs> and then go and wait for one another, he says. Wait for one another. So the unworthy manner was that, that their selfish, self-centered, unrepentant um, disregard for some of the members of the church that were right there in the building. No respect for them. Which was a denial of identity in the gospel and denied it. And so this unworthy manner of participating was that. 
It doesn't apply to someone who says, I'm struggling with a sin. Well, that's the point. Come to the supper and confess your sin and receive the grace of God. You aren't cut off. You aren't eliminated because you're wrestling with something. Can I let you in on something? We all wrestle with something. We all come. We come and we are not disqualified because we are we feel unworthy to participate because of the way that we've been living. Again, no one is worthy. Christ makes us worthy by covering our sin. Melanchthon, who was uh, one of Luther's protégés, said, some will not venture to profess Christ until they can rather profess themselves. They wait for worthiness to come to the Lord's table, not considering that it is unworthiness which they are to profess. <laughs> In other words, that's humility. Let's be real with God. He knows you're unworthy. Deal with your heart. He says, it's unworthiness which they are to profess along with Christ's worthiness. Keep those two together, he says, right? Come admitting your sin, and come admitting there's one name that will wipe away your sin. And that's the name of Jesus, you see. And come trusting. Draw near to God. And so when it says examine yourself, what's the goal here? It's not to say, am I, am I good enough this time? Examine yourselves. And then confess. Examine yourself. And speak to God. Humble yourself. If you cherish a sin, if you know you are cherishing and clinging to a sin that you refuse to leave behind, now you're coming to the table in an unworthy manner, you see. Because you're just going through the motions of, I'll take this, I'll drink it all the time. I'm just clinging to my sin. And so, listen, discipline is real. God's discipline is real. But so is grace. So is grace. The table's meant to, to reveal that, expose it, and humble you, and bring you to a place where God will embrace you and cleanse your conscience, right? If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to, for, to forgive us all our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, I just briefly attach... Matthew 5, because sometimes people attach that. I know that was my tradition being brought up there where we're told in Matthew 5, 23 to 24, if you have offended your brother, you hurt your brother, you know, leave your sacrifice at the altar and go get right with your brother uh, first. And you've heard that here at different times because that's part of different traditions. But, and it's part of my uh, original background, but that's not right. Let me clarify wh why. First of all, in Matthew 5, the worship in view is Jewish worship, Jewish Old Testament worship. And the sacrifice the man was bringing was a sacrifice to be reconciled to God. Uh, we are reconciled to God. You got that? <laughs> we are at peace with God. Uh, this, this, our sacrifice has been sacrificed. Christ, our Passover. So this is not speaking directly to the Lord's Supper. It's not talking about the Lord's Supper, you say. Uh, is there a principle then to be drawn from it? A, a general principle. Yeah, the general principle is people matter more than religious observance. People matter more than religious observance. So do what? This is not a command to abstain. It's, uh, it's a command to, well, confess it. Confess your, 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 your disagreement. Confess your attitude to this person. Humble yourself and partake in the Lord's Supper. It's not a command to abstain until everything gets straightened out. This becomes just another sin. I'm struggling with this sin. I got into this mess with her or him. Okay, come to the table, confess it, and seek the Lord's grace and his strength, right? Furthermore, since in the new covenant, all of life is worship, and standing here singing and coming here and praying and all this is worship, and it's not that you shouldn't, if you hold that view, it's not that you should abstain from the Lord's Supper. Hey, you shouldn't even be here. Why? Because... 
all of life's worship under the new covenant. And so that's not what it's talking about. Secondly, sometimes you can't uh, fix things with people. And you say, I couldn't fix it. They're gone. They moved. They won't answer my call. Uh, there's, this is not some sort of technical label that says, well, then you can't come to the Lord's Supper, that, you say. That, that, that's not what's happening here. It's all about your heart attitude. And if you perpetually abstain until you can close this, then you're, you're, now you're wrestling with something else. What? That you're not trusting the Lord and coming to His Supper. Ah. <laughs> uh, and so if you are the offender, the only reason you should abstain is like any other sin, you know you're the offender and you are cherishing it. You are clinging to it. You refuse to humble yourself. You won't, uh, you won't submit your pride and go talk or, or admit anything. Well, now, that, you see, this is just like any other sin. You need to confess to the Lord and ask for the grace to, to have your heart changed over this, you see. So all that to say is we won't be mentioning Matthew 5 and singling it out as some sort of label that says you can't participate. It, it is a sin like any other sin. Examine yourself. Are you cherishing these things? Don't. Come to the table. Confess to the Lord. Seek His grace. Confess your sin. He will cleanse you and remind you of His grace and mercy in your life. So how shall we participate? This is where we're going in a few minutes. I don't want to address all these, you know, frequency, they argue, some argue for every week, some quarterly, some, some churches only take the Lord's Supper once a year. Uh, I can't imagine that. The New Testament gives no explicit, direct command. We practice the Lord's Supper once a month plus every fifth Sunday of any month, so 16 times a year we will take the Lord's Supper until we'll do it that way until somehow the, the elders are led in a different direction, but that's that. How about wine or juice? Uh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to get into that one much. Uh, you know, so I, I just, let's just get rid of some of the crazy things like, well, the, the disciples were actually drinking fermented wine. Well, what was happening in Corinth, okay? No, but uh, the, the fruit of the vine includes juice, and, and for some who have wrestled deeply with uh, uh, alcohol, uh, for practical reasons, uh, many traditions just don't use alcohol, you see. There's no reason it needs to be wine. What about one loaf? We said that last week. It's a beautiful imagery, but there's some pra practical issues and hygiene and so forth if, uh, you know, we're throwing out a loaf and... It's going to take an hour to make its way through here, especially when it gets to you guys that are real hungry, and you're like, you know, what? Do you not have a homes to eat in? <laughs> yeah. What about individually or together? Again, no explicit command. We take it all together. We say, let's partake together. Why? It strengthens that view of our unity, that picture. What about my attitude when I come in? Shouldn't it, be, uh, shouldn't it be somber? This is about the death of Christ. Listen, he's not still dying, okay? Uh, this is a victory lap, <laughs> right? The reverence, yes, absolutely. Reverence, especially as we confess our sin and we, we speak to the Lord and we acknowledge that I haven't, this is a realignment of where my life's been. But this is a celebration of the finished work of Christ, and so reverential joy filled with gratitude ought to be what marks our time together. We shouldn't just come flippantly. What should I do? What should I think when I'm going through the supper then? Well, Michael Green, uh, a historian of the early church, gave this great little summary. I've modified it a little bit. He says, to look in the various directions uh, that the supper points to. So when you come, we're about to go to the supper here as we sing some songs. Look back, he says to Christ's death, right? He laid down his life for you. It wasn't taken. He himself bore our sins in his body. Look back to Christ's death with gratitude. Look in. Look in with self-examination. Am I cherishing any sin? Am I clinging to a sin? I didn't say, are you sinless? I didn't say, are you worthy? I'm saying this is the time for realignment. This is that moment to say, yeah, this is where I'm at, Lord, help me. Be honest. Third, look up. Look up in fellowship with God, right? Christ is our great high priest. He is seated on the throne. He rules over all the universe. Bring him your problems. 
look around in fellowship with one another. We are one body. Look around, remember, God loves these people just like he loves me. Pray for some maybe as you're taking the supper. Look forward. Look forward to Christ's return, right? The best lies ahead still. These are the appetizers. Remember, you can forgive. Why? Because vengeance is mine, says the Lord. He will make all wrongs right. Let the supper be a time of healing, of letting go of bitterness and things because you're looking forward to the time that Christ will, will deal with everything. You see. So I hope that helps you, okay? And I think that um, you know, the, the, these are kind of things we want to do together and encourage and, and uh, help you in the participation of the supper. So now, I'm not going to go through all that again as we take the supper. <laughs> Uh, but we will take the supper together. Let's use this time for some silent prayer and preparation as the uh, elements are passed during the song. And when you're, when you're done being silent, you can pray, you can sing along as well. So let me pray that our time will be rich and we'll have the musicians lead us. Lord, Lord meet us in this time of the supper. Draw near to us by your mercy and grace and help us, God, to benefit from this time through the presence of your Holy Spirit ministering Christ to us. In Christ's name, amen.